Hello, I'm Mark and uh, well, this is Maggie Moo and together we're here to introduce the Underground History Show. Titles, big budget stuff for our very own program aimed fairly and squarely at the world of metal detecting. So, what have we got for you in this first program? Well, uh, Laurie McGregor is on a beach in Nairn and she's joined by Adrian a little bit later on in our kit store feature looking at Mind Lab's Vanquish 540. We're going to ask you to show us uh, some of your collections uh, during later programmes. But in this programme, Simon Isles came in to the headquarters here at the Underground History Show to show us some of the stuff that he's dug up in the past. And mercifully, we had a camera recording the whole thing. We'll show it to you in a bit. But we start with a bloke stood in the middle of an empty field in Essex. Can this bloke possibly make an empty field in any way, shape or form interesting? Well... We're talking about jewels here, and if anyone can make an empty field interesting, it's him. And I'm thinking Roman Villas. Ah, oh, look, there he is. The old Jules Evanhart, out in its natural habitat, middle of a muddy field. <laughs> Actually, we're delighted, of course, that Julian has joined the Underground History Show. Our Jules is the UK's leading light in metallic history. He's also the editor of Treasure Hunting magazine, the most read in the country, and he's the author of 17 books about our hobby. Actually, it's very difficult to think of how we could have done this programme without Julian. It's harvest, that time of year of rich reward for our farmer friends. Of course, the rewards for we detectorists lie under the soil in the hundreds and thousands of coins and artefacts which enrich our history, heritage and indeed culture, saved for the nation. Well, I've been detecting now for more years than I care to think. In fact, it's approaching the big five zero. And in that time, I've come to a conclusion. And that is that sharing, sharing knowledge, sharing facts, sharing observations, is critically important to the ongoing nature of our hobby. And I would like to demonstrate that by sharing with you all this Essex cornfield. Well, that's not much of a share, you might ask, but actually it is. Because if you look around here, there's some small undulations. Okay, I can tell you're still not that impressed. These undulations relate to Roman settlement. How do I know that? Only through experience and the sharing of knowledge through other people. Now, this Believe it or not, 1,700 years ago was a luxurious, probably 20-room Roman villa owned by, shall we have a guess at? We don't know, a senator, maybe a, an imperially employed general who resided, his office was in Colchester, but his importance and stature in Roman society meant that he lived 15 miles away in a rural countryside, surrounded by some soldiers to help him out certainly slaves and his family. This is not a farmstead. This is something this guy would almost certainly have been known by the current emperor of the time. Now, what's he left behind for us? Well, a veritable feast of things. He's left roof tile fragments, more roof tile fragments, cookery pottery, basic greyware. Cooks and the slaves would have struggled and really, you know, cooked all the food in order to provide absolute luxury for this guy who probably didn't appreciate it because he was who he was but we can only guess who this guy was 
I mean, just have a look at some of these things. This is five minutes of being here. How wealthy was this guy? He could afford window glass. There are probably no more than 40 villas in the whole of the UK that had window glass fitted. This man could afford to have his house 2,000 years or so ago centrally heated. And we can tell this by these box flue tiles, which have still got the plaster keying. You can almost feel that labourer who gently pushed across that comb to get that. from people walking around the field with their dogs, families out for a nice countryside evening walk. Very few people are aware of what once stood here, the, the sheer opulence, the magnificence, and the sheer power that would have dominated this countryside for miles and miles around. Everyone would have known this guy, the remaining Celtic tribes that were still in existence, everybody would have known him. And he probably, as we've already said, was employed somewhere in Colchester. Did he have to go to work every day like you and me? I doubt it very much, as a matter of fact. It's probably once a month attendance into the main city and he would have just lived lying out, eating grapes on here. And believe you me, when you have this type of opulence, this is the pinnacle of Roman occupation in the UK. And metal detecting here, well, we found things, but it's not just 1,700 years ago. History has been going on here since well, since the world started, but metallic history. I'm now going to share with you another aspect of that and show you just a few of the things which metal detectorists have found around this area. This is only a relatively new site for us, but we have been working surrounding fields and we found artifacts which almost certainly relate to the gentleman or his family members who resided here. So let me show you now. I'm just going to take you to this discreetly camouflaged bag and show you some of the wonderful things that we have unearthed in the last couple of weeks. Talking of soldiers, well there's a Roman military buckle. One of the horse heads has broken off it, but it looks pretty good for 2,000 years. Certainly a lot better than most of us will look after such a time span. But what a magnificent thing, you know, you can feel the pure history in this. A small child's brooch. I mean, you, you know, the images that you just conjure up, you know, and that this little child has been dead now for 1,700 years. You know, totally unrecorded in history. Unrecorded, apart from a tiny little brooch. Did his sister or mother perhaps have this beautiful silver-coated glass enameled umbernate brooch attached to her toga? Well, you tell me, because the marvellous thing about detecting is when you find things like this, we can all share in the guessing and we're all right. Nobody can prove us wrong. And that's the great mind stretching thing about metal detecting. And he would have spent lots of silver and gold. We haven't found any of the gold yet, but look at that magnificent siloquy of the Emperor Valens. So this gives us a rough time, you know, um, around about the 330s to the 370s that this coin was lost, maybe even later. Maybe a Saxon picked it up and it was spent for a further 200 years. But a magnificent coin, and again, illustrative of the sheer opulence of what basically, today, is just a cornfield in Essex. Thanks very much, Jules. Well, that was interesting. And our young chum will be back in this field in our next episode. Only he'll be time travelling to the 20th century and looking into a bit of aviation archaeology. I'm sure most people would probably just laugh at that. Inverness Detectress is one of the country's newest clubs. Coming of age during lockdown, the club initially bonded online through a Facebook group. Siblings Ian Simpson and Angie McLeod realised there were no member vacancies at their nearest club. Despite being complete beginners themselves, they rose to the challenge of forming a Highland club that welcomed all levels and now boasts 245 members. They've even done their part to promote the positives of metal detecting in the local media. Making the news after members spent two days clearing a motocross track that had been vandalised with nails. 
The farmer tells us, Legend has it this field was camped in by Bonnie Prince Charlie's forces on their way to Elgin to ambush Cumberland in 1745. Anything good coming out? It's here. Copper watch. Oh, that's great. Oh, it looks copper. Have, have you found many of those? No, it's my first one. Oh, right. Oh, so it's a special day then. Yeah. That's great. Anything else in that hole? Uh, yes. You were here a while. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Do you know what that is? No. That's actually a frame for a fabric covered button. It's um, a lot of people think they're curtain rings because they come out like that, but the rounded interior shows that it's a it's a frame that fabric covered and it's a it's a special find. Wow, that is amazing. That is truly that's military that is. I wonder if that's the 72nd regiment or something. Mm -hmm. yeah, wow. That's really lovely. It's so clear. You can tell that the soil here isn't actually eating the, the fines and yeah. it's, it's not been had a lot of chemicals put on it by yeah, the farmers. So yeah. that's, that's superb. Oh, well, go and find lots more. One of the gifts of our hobby is getting out and about in nature. Every season offers different species, but not all are friendly. This pretty yellow plant is the ragwort, and it's a poisonous weed. It poses a real risk to livestock. However, its flowers are among the most visited by butterflies in the UK. It can regenerate from its roots if these are not completely removed. If the Jacobite forces did camp in this field, the artifacts would be difficult to locate because older locals tell us that the field has had multiple loads of fill and topsoil spread on it in their lifetimes. Another local tells us that this field was a campsite for Allied troops in World War II and also a long-time campsite for cadets and reserve units into recent memory. The finds are certainly weird and wonderful, and definitely support the story of fill and spoil coming in from multiple areas. Cap badges have been detected in abundance, again supporting the 20th century military campsite reports. This print plate, which we've reversed for legibility, is one of several found on the site. Fixed print plates like this were actually in use even after 1450, when Johannes Gutenberg introduced the metal movable type printing press in Europe. This fixed plate is made of cheap white metal and these sort were sometimes used to print into soft material. However, this may be Edwardian as these plates were also used in the mass production of pamphlets. giving field. As well as several hundred finds, it also gives freely of the gift of detector fooling coke. I wonder if it was from the traction engines waiting to get onto the old road. More likely, multiple loads of rubbish brought in here 
There's certainly evidence of burning, and a previous life is a dump. Old maps don't show any buildings on this site. has really divided opinion. Is it a spike from a colonial style pith helmet? Could be Victorian police or possibly a German pickle hub. Others think it could be architectural, maybe railway related. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. Our flame haired detecting goddess, Laurie McGregor is a passionate detectorist. Only recently coming into our hobby, she's already got a loyal following on social media. I'll be putting the 540 Pro Pack through its paces at a beach in the far north of Scotland, while Adrian Gaylor has a date with the wee red beauty on farmland in Essex. The entry level sector is a crowded place. Every year, it seems, there's a new player loading new tech. Entry-level detectors are big sellers, so it's crucial for manufacturers to get this right. MineLab, for their part, launched the Vanquish line in 2019. With its bold styling, you certainly won't confuse it with any other machine. The Vanquish 540 is the top-end detector in MineLab's entry-level adult range. This is a great machine to grow through with you. You can just turn it on and go. You don't have to worry about anything. MineLab's wonderful multi-IQ system means you don't even have to worry about ground balancing it. It just does it. It's great. But when you're ready to move on to something a bit more custom, it's there for you. One of the items that comes with the 540 Pro Pack is this rain cover, which will protect your machine if the weather catches you out. The 540 has many features available that its younger siblings don't have. So if you can go for this version, I would recommend it. The 540 that we are looking at today sets atop of a three machine range, bearing the famous MineLab V. Here's a quick look at what you get with each machine. Some features are really worth the extra cost. One of these is the inbuilt pinpointer, which, unlike the Equinox, you don't push the button once and just pinpoint. You have to hold it down, but it's very easy to keep depressed. You wait for the lines to come together, and it's absolutely under your coil, right in the center every time. The pinpointer is supremely accurate. I would advise, though, that you practice with it because one of the features of this machine is that it detunes the signal for you. It narrows the field on the pinpoint, so it tidies it up. If you're a bit slow, you might have to let go of the button and go back to it as it narrows the field, but it's very, very accurate. For the beginning detectorist, with a bit more change in their pocket, it wants to get a machine that can grow with them. The 540 is a fantastic choice. You can just turn it on and go. It will hold your hand, it will teach you. As you become more accomplished, you can customize the machine. There's a custom mode where you can notch out the signals that you don't want the machine to tell you about. 
The balance on this machine is fantastic. You can literally swing it with just two fingers. You could be out here all day and you won't suffer for it. Really is a delight. This beach is also known for Coke and the Vanquish just doesn't even see it. Thanks to MindLab's multi-IQ system, you don't have to worry about digging up things that are gonna be junk, that are gonna be Coke, because it just ignores them. Thank you, Vanquish. The Pro Pack comes with wireless headphones, two coils, and this very handy rain cover that will see you protected when the weather gets a bit unpredictable. While the Vanquish coils are waterproof down to one meter, the control box is not. Essex, not far from the ancient Roman town of Colchester, where the Romans successfully vanquished their enemies. He may be rubbish at jokes, but Adrian joins the team as one of the most experienced field testers in the world. I think that sets the right tone. Now that's a sound you can listen to every day. The clear, concise tones from the MindLab Vanquish with a mid to high reading and a BDI of 19. That's something you could listen to all day long. Let's take a look, come on. Given that the founder of MindLab, Bruce Candy, has also designed high-end hi-fi equipment, it should come as no surprise that the quality of the tones is so good. MindLab have more patents for metal detecting technology than any other brand, and the Vanquish gets its fair share of that family silver. The headline here is Multi-IQ, MindLab's multi-frequency tech. Think of it as a torch. The wider the beam, or in the detector's cases, the width of the range of frequency sent and received by the coil head, the more types of metal are picked up. Some metals will reflect lower, mid, or high frequencies, respectively. Use them all, and you'll see more metal. A lot of emphasis is put on depth, and while the Vanquish is certainly capable on that metric, it's recovery speed and discrimination that makes the real difference, particularly on trashy sites. Back to the mud. This stuff is typical for this area. Lime-rich, loamy and clayey soils with impeded drainage to a network of streams. Or, as Adrian puts it... This soil is very, very claggy. It's very fertile land, meaning it will have been worked a lot over the centuries to feed the county. There we go. Nice little buckle. And this means fines relating to farm workers are frequent. Something else that is frequent is potential electrical interference.
Turning on the Vanquish 540, you may wonder what it's doing when it makes those tones. Basically, the machine is looking for any electrical interference from external sources or within the field and selecting the clearest channel on the machine to give you the most enjoyable experience when out in the field. This makes the machine much quieter and a pleasure to use. been detecting for about 12 years now. Um, I used to beach comb when I was a kid. I finally uh, got enough money together to buy a proper metal detector and uh, enjoyed the hobby ever since. First machine was um, one of those cheap 50 pound metal detectors and I thought I could get away with using that but no you need something a bit better than a 50 pound metal detector. So I now use a Mine Lab Quattro. This is a Charles the First shilling uh, found in an area with a few other bits and pieces that Charles I. I'm not sure it's enough to warrant being a hoard yet, but if I find any more in the same area, then it will be and be recorded as a hoard, hopefully. Um, that is nice. It's a nice, decent-sized silver coin. Um, they always put a smile on your face. It's all stuff that tells a story. It's all... You can look at your collection and everything's... I've got a coin um, from Richard the Lionheart, um, and then I've got King John after that. When this came out of the ground, I looked at the patina and I thought, that's Bronze Age, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. So I wandered over quite quickly to uh, see my metal detecting friend and uh, showed it to him and I said, what do you reckon? I mean, I can't, it's, it's a bit of something and it's Bronze Age, you can tell by the patina. And he said, oh, I know what that is. That's a votive offering axe head. And I had a dream that night where I was introduced to the chief of the tribe. And um, I woke up, from the, woke up from the dream and I thought, no, don't sell any of the Bronze Age. I can't. I was the keeper of those artifacts and they were safely entrusted to me. The papal bulla of, or bulle of Pope Gregory the Ninth um, went off to the British Museum to be verified and it turns out that there's two different types of papal bulla. One of them would be the um, papal bulle that you could buy if you wanted to buy your way into heaven. Uh, you'd go along to the church, possibly, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but chat to the bishop and say, I think I've been a bad person. Um, and you could buy a papal bulla, um, which would then buy your way out of hell um, get yourself into he into heaven if you're a rich person. This particular papal bulla, bulle, um, it has been verified by the British Museum that it was attached by rope um, to the to a papal decree. So it's not one of these ones. It is actually one from uh, a papal decree that would have been sent out round the Christian world um, as to what the Pope has wants to happen, like um, this particular pope uh, decreed that black cats were the uh, work of the devil and should be put to death, uh, which didn't really help around the time of the Black Death, um, because less cats about, more rats around. This is a Henry VI groat with some lovely detail on it. A real shame that on the other side of it, it looks like it's been hit by something. It doesn't look damaged enough to be hit by a plough, but something's hit it. Um, but the reverse of it, that's got a nice bit of detail. That This is the sort of coin that us detectorists will find and that puts a smile on our face for the day and makes the day worthwhile. I think my collection, because most of it has been found um, on one particular farm and it, it's a visual history of the history of the land around that farm. Um, yeah, going back through, going back through pre-Christian, Bronze, like Bronze Age, through Roman, Viking, I've got a 
some Viking that have turned up on that particular land, you can, you can see the things that have been dropped and lost throughout the hundreds or maybe thousands of years, or actually thousands of years, on that land. And um, the Fines Liaison Officer uh, sent this off to the British Museum for a complete identification and they still haven't got back in contact with me over this. It looks like it's a winged thunderbolt design Celtic slingshot piece of ammo, which there isn't any recorded being found in this country. The only other one that's been recorded was found in Greece. So it's got a, a the, des, the design on it is quite distinctly winged thunderbolt. I think that metal detecting is good for general well-being as you're out in the fresh air. Um, it's re rewarding when you, find a, when you find something, no matter what it is, whether you find a horseshoe, whether you find um, a gold coin. Um, you, it, it, connects, it connects you with your local history. Perhaps Simon's greatest achievement in detecting is his work with Essex Support Advice and Mentoring Services. His Metal Detecting for Recovery project has really given a higher purpose to our hobby, serving the wider community. The positive benefits of metal detecting was giving those in recovery, something to do to take their minds off uh, their addiction, um, like helping breaking that habit, um, getting them interested in local history, um, taking them out in the fresh air. Um, uh, it was mainly give people something else to do to help take their minds away from the horrible ad addiction they were addicted to. Some of those people continued, uh, continued being involved in our hobby. Simon's coin here belonged to a Celtic people. Now what, according to some scholars, links Troy with Camelot? Well, the answer, the Trinovanti tribe. Now, the legend goes a bit like this. The Trinovanti name comes from Tri or Troy Novantum, which it's claimed means New Troy, fitting with another intriguing theory that Britain was founded by refugees from the Trojan history, including Brutus. The Celtic name for Colchester was Camulodunum, which transformed through the mists of time to Camelot. Well, lovely though that theory is, there's no real evidence to support that the city really was the location of the Arthurian Camelot, but look out for a future history detective with Jules to delve deeper into Celtic Britain. I think it's amazing, our local tribe, and I'm finding stuff that was lost or dropped by them. Be detecting the land that I grew up on, I feel much more connected with, an with ancestors. Um, but there's so many of us out there detecting. We're helping piece together our history of this country. I think that's it. So there we are, the end of our very first The Underground History Show show. Did you like it? Well, let us know in the comment boxes below and don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Okay, we have got loads and loads and loads of things to be getting on with for programme number two, including our wall of hall. We are asking you to send in your photographs of things that you found like um well like neil Schilling here okay so while you get on with that i'll get on with pinning these on the wall and we'll all meet up again same place same time bye we're all searching from the cradle to the grave scattered secrets waiting to be seen in the meantime, don't you worry and Take your time, don't hurry Dig on, dig on Have a little patience But most of all, have a little fun And keep 
on swinging And daybreak through till night And keep it singing mm. Man, you'll do all right In the meantime, don't you worry Take your time, don't worry Take on, yeah Have a little patience but most of all, have a little fun Don't matter what you find A man where life dig on If your day's full On a beach or in a field Just be grateful for everything you yield In the meantime, don't you worry Until your time, don't worry